All right, so when we talk about tools in the toolbox, and we talk about different types of treatments, um, there's been so much interest in PRRT, or maybe you've heard it referred to now as RLT, um, even before it was uh, approved in the United States because it was available in Europe for many, many years. So we're going to talk about this particular treatment. Maybe some of you have had it. And as we know, the research uh, is absolutely ongoing to improve this treatment, to make it applicable to hopefully more patients. And our expert to talk about that today is Dr. Heather Jacine. She is um, the Clinical Director of Nuclear Medicine and PET-CT at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and Associate Program Director of the Brigham and Women's Nuclear Medicine Program. So please welcome Dr. Jacine. Thank you and good evening everyone. I'm really delighted to be here to share about nuclear medicine uh, this afternoon. These are my disclosures. And so I hope in the next 20 minutes to really provide an understanding of how nuclear medicine helps for neuroendocrine tumors and to give an update about what's new in nuclear medicine for neuroendocrine tumors. And in the past, we really only mostly talked about imaging for nuclear medicine, but now it's really a combined talk about imaging and therapy. And I want to show this slide Maybe you have heard this term out there, it's theranostics, and what does that actually mean? So in nuclear medicine, I'm gonna talk, part of the talk about imaging, and that's diagnostic molecular imaging. So like the PET scans, uh, patients can come in, they can have a scan, and we can look to see whether there's a target there or not that's available for a therapy to be given. And then we can change the radioactivity that's on it, and we can give um, a therapy, and that's what PRRT is, and so we'll talk about that as well. And so when you typically think about radiology, you are going in for a scan like a CT scan or an MRI scan. Typically, someone will, oops, I've been doing this all day. A person will lay, lie on the scanner here, you go through the tube and radiation or the x-rays come out from the scanner and you get an image that looks like this, which tells us about the way that organs look in your body or the structure of the organs. What nuclear medicine is, is based on uh, this idea that we can give very small amounts of radioactivity that don't affect how your body functions, but can show us how the organs are working um, to, to, trace those pro to trace those processes. And that's where, if you ever hear the term radio tracer uh, comes from. And this is actually George de Havesi who came up with this. And this is actually the 100th year anniversary of when he came up with that principle. And so different than what we just saw for radiology, we actually give the patient the radioactivity and the x-rays come out from the patient and the scanner detects those x-rays and we get an image that looks something like this. This is a dotatate scan. Um, today we have combined scanners that can do both the functional imaging like this PET scan and the CT scan. So that's where the terms PET CT comes from or you might have had a spec CT CT scan if you had a bone scan in the past. There are a lot of different processes in your body and in cancer cells that we can look at with nuclear medicine. And all of these kind of little circles are all the different processes that can happen in those cells that we can target with the nuclear medicine and different um, radioacti radioactive substances or drugs. The ones that I'm really gonna focus on here though are, as we already talked about, somatostatin receptors like a dotatate PET-CT scan or Octrea scan. Um, we talked a little, somebody already mentioned FDG, which looks at glucose metabolism, so how uh, much your, your tumor is using uh, sugar in, that's in your blood. And then another one is MIBG, which is really used for different type of neuroendocrine tumor, a pheochromocytoma or a, paragangli or a paraganglioma. And so why do we do imaging? There are a couple of goals that we have. We can help uh, detect if a tumor is present. We can look at the extent of the tumor in a body. Um, it can tell us information about how somebody is going to do over time. We can look, use the images to tell us how a tumor is responding to different therapies. And it also can tell us if a particular target is there um, for treatments like we do for PRRT. 
So in 2016, um, this was in 2020, these were big years for nuclear medicine where we switched from some old imaging agents that we had called Octrea scan um, to now what we use and essentially as a replaced Octrea scan as PET um, with these two agents that are looking for somatostatin receptor imaging. And what did this um, give, give us? So this is what an old scan uh, used to look like, an Octrea scan. This was a 50-year-old man who was found, um, in, had a, a CT scan done for abdominal pain. And what you can see, this, this black dot here is actually the neuroendocrine uh, tumor that's in the liver. Um, all of this black stuff is the kidneys, which is normal, and the spleen. So all we could really see here was there was another kind of hazy spot that looked like maybe this was something, but it's difficult to tell, and that that might be the primary tumor um, in the patient's duodenum. The same person had a dotatate scan, and I know that you're not all radiologists or nuclear medicine physicians, but hopefully you can see the difference between the blurriness kind of of this image, and this one is a, li is a little bit sharper. So in this image, you can see the liver tumor. We can confirm that this is a, the, probably the primary lesion in the duodenum, so we can confirm that we found that. But we also found that there was another very small lymph node that was kind of on the other side, so this would help the surgeon to better plan a surgery if they were going to resect the primary um, and then treat the liver metastasis. This is another patient. Um, who also had a, neuroendoc a neuroendocrine tumor and a dotatate PET scan. We could help, again, find the primary lesion. There were some small lesions on the liver. And then one of, the, I think, the challenges is when we have an imaging test that's a little bit more sensitive, so it increases our ability to find things. Sometimes we don't always know what that actually means or how that's going to affect somebody's ultimate outcome really over a long period of time, and that happened in this case. Um, where the patient also had a lesion in their bone that was really, un you couldn't see it on a CT scan or any other imaging modality. And whether this bone lesion, this is always, I think, a very tough discussion to have with, the, with your doctor, is that we don't know if we would have ever detected this bone lesion um, if we didn't have this Dota tape PET CT scan. And because of that, a lot of the knowledge of how we treat these treat these patients, we're still learning about what happens when there are some things that we don't expect or we wouldn't have otherwise seen. Uh, somebody also, I earlier they mentioned kind of the different grades of that the tumors. There are different types of, as I showed you on that wheel, there are different types of PET scans. So not all PET scans are the same. And so when we talk about the well-differentiated tumors, most of you, you're more likely to have a dotatate PET CT scan, which is going to look for the somatostatin receptors. If you have a more poorly differentiated tumor, you might be more likely to have an FDG PET scan to look for glucose metabolism. And sometimes you might need both, depending on whether there's some question about whether the tumor is a lower, a well-differentiated or a poor differ poorly differentiated tumor. And then this is just an example of, of what that could look like on a scan. In this particular person, there, was, um, there were uh, areas of tumor, that's the black parts that have both FDG and dotatate uptake here. But there were some areas that had FDG uptake in the pelvis that didn't have dotatate uptake. And so how you might treat these might be, you might have to consider different treatment options depending on what are the targets are present or not. So now moving on to, um, PEP, to PRRT. And so essentially PRRT uh, Lutathera is very similar to the octreotide or the lanreotide that you might get, except it has radioactivity on it. And so the octreotide is kind of your targeting molecule. And if you think of this, as a um, the blues the blue dots are the tumors and then here's your receptors the octreotide comes in it binds to the tumor cells and then hopefully things happen in the cell and those cells die but if you don't have that binding that happens those some cells may be left behind when you add the radioactivity on it you still use that targeting molecule in order to reach your cells so here. But then there's radioactivity, and then hopefully that radioactivity can target not only the cells that bind, but also the ones that are next door to it. That's called the crossfire effect, and that's one of the benefits of the radioactivity. 
And this is the big study, Nutter One, that led to the approval of uh, Ludafera for well-differentiated uh, neuroendocrine tumors. The study showed that in patients who got the Ludafera compared to those who had um, high-dose octreotide, that the time that it took for those tumors to get bigger um, was a longer period of time. Um, but in that study, the objective response rate or the tumor shrinking that occurred in about only, it occurred in about 20%, 18% of patients. And at 20 months after getting PRT, the chance of not progressing was 65%. So although this was better than the high dose octreotide, you can see that eventually over time, um, there is tumor that's still there and that can still um, progress. And one of the new questions or one of the big questions people are always asking is more PRRT, another a treatment option. And so there are really a very small number of studies that have looked at this question about retreatment with PRRT. Um, I should actually, before I go on to that PRRT, just uh, for those who have had PRRT in the past, typically this is an IV injection kind of through a, through a vein, and you get four doses, you typically would get four doses of those about eight weeks, about eight weeks apart. And so the question then really is, can you give more than the four doses at the time when something is then progressing? So there's a small, very small number of studies that have looked at it. Uh, the studies were heterogeneous, meaning there were lots of different ways that the, the retreatment PRRT was given, different number of cycles, different radioactive agents. Um, there was one uh, report which kind of took all of the studies that were available and made it into one, instead of 13 individual studies, they made that into one report. Um, and they showed that people who had additional cycles of PRRT, they had, a, their tumor didn't progress on average for another 12 months. Um, the median disease control rate, meaning again, for the retreatment was about 71%. So it meaning if you had a second course of PRRT, uh, the tumor didn't uh, change, could be controlled in 71% of patients. Um, it didn't matter which agent of PRRT that you got. In the US, we have lutetium uh, dotatate. There are several others that are available outside the US. It didn't matter which one you got. Um, there were more severe side effects in 5% of patients with, re with retreatment. But in general, the side effects were very similar to the first course of therapy that you had. Um, there was one case of severe um, kidney toxicity, um, and they didn't see one of the one of the side effects that can happen with PRRT over a period of time. There's about a two to four percent chance of bone marrow not functioning or developing a cancer in the bone marrow. Um, they didn't find in this particular group of patients that that had increased with with retreatment. Um, since uh, that study was published in 2021, there are a couple of newer studies, but the results are fairly similar, so I didn't want to give you all the details of all of them. Um, there is a, um, an important, this is called the NET Retreat trial, which opened in uh, Canada and some sites in the United States, and I think this will be an important one because it's going to be probably the lar one of the largest studies looking at using Ludothera in a retreatment setting. Um, this is for people who have metastatic unresectable Unresectable, unresectable midgut neuroendocrine tumors, and you have you have to have had um, stable disease for at least 12 months after PRRT, and then your disease gets a little bit worse, and then there's a randomization in the study to get repeat PRRT or to get everolimus, a kind of chemotherapy. So I think kind of in summary for retreatment, um, there can be responses to retreatment uh, with PRRT. The side effects mostly seem very similar to the first course of PRRT. Um, how many doses you can get after that four and the num so the optimal dose level um, and the number of cycles that you can get is really is not well defined and was a little bit variable in those, stud in those studies. So hopefully the retreatment trial will help with that. I think if there is, if if you are considering retreatment, there are several things to talk about, um, especially the time of disease control. So in most of those studies, the disease was stable for really, most of them had 12 months or 18 months of stability um, prior to retreatment. So if 
Ludoth if after Ludothera there was disease getting worse after three or four months, it's probably you wouldn't necessarily think that it worked the first time very well in order to go on to retreatment. Uh, making sure that the current laboratory parameters and how your labs responded to the initial PRT is considered. And right now in the United States, there's not coverage, it's not covered by, it's not on the label indication for retreatment. I mean, I think there have been some success, successes of individual patients and individual individual sites where they have been able to get insurance coverage for retreatment, but that's also um, a consideration at that time. Um, then the other new topic that's really big is um, what about alpha particle PRRT? So Ludothera is a beta particle, and so a beta, oops, a beta particle um, travels a, a little bit longer of a distance than an alpha particle. So this is a beta here, and this is an alpha. The beta particle travels farther and results in single-stranded uh, single stranded breaks, whereas an alpha particle travels a shorter distance, but uh, results in double-strand DNA breaks. So basically, this is a little bit more bang for your buck at the level of, of the DNA. Um, there are, I'm not going to read all of this, but there are a number of studies that have looked at different alpha particles. You may hear about actinium or lead. Uh, 212 are two different alpha particles. They essentially showed that there is activity of the alpha particle against the neuroendocrine tumor. And there are several different um, studies um, that are, those are closed ones. Uh, one of the largest ones um, right now that's currently, that's open is this action one study that's looking at actinium dotatate. So it's basically the same targeting molecule with an alpha particle um, in uh, inoperable advanced uh, somatostatin receptor positive well differentiated METs that have been stable for a period of time um, but have already um, had disease get, that's gotten worse after PRRT. Um, some other updates, uh, the, there was a recent presentation of the phase three, the NETR2 study. So in this study, they looked at Ludothera um, in uh, newly diagnosed G2, G3 advanced GEPnet, so more um, higher grade tumors, and patients were randomized to either get the lutetium dotatator, the lutathera, versus high-dose octreotide as their first treatment option, so the first line of therapy, and they did show that the progression-free survival um, and overall response rates were higher in the lutathera group. Um, there was uh, less than three grade three or four cytopenias, meaning the blood counts declined um, in one case of MD MDS. And so I think this it was uh, recently presented and will be something that doctors are, your medical oncologists are now considering. Um, this isn't a currently in indica labeled indication, but the study could change that. So it will be interesting to see uh, if there will be another option in the higher grade tumors um, with Ludothera soon. Um, and then there are a number of studies just looking at how do we um, optimize um, the Ludothera, can we give it with other, other agents, and in, in what sequence. So just in summary, um, on the imaging side, we can use uh, nuclear medicine imaging for diagnosis to help select therapy and look at response, response to therapy. And then PRRT, um, it, does seem to work, it does seem to work in these tumors, primarily by stabilizing the tumors and preventing them from getting, getting bigger. Um, it's fairly tolerable therapy. Uh, most commonly, people were watching blood counts and other organ functions, and then there are a lot of investigations looking at optimizing uh, the glutathera now for the current indications, but also looking for um, other indications. And then everyone's also very excited about alpha particle uh, therapy. So thank you very much.